Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for coming and welcome you um, today for our discussion on Les Majesté in the context of rhetoric and dissent. Um, my name is Lisa Gardner. I'm a freelance journalist. I've worked in a number of countries where free expression um, has not been a guaranteed uh, right. So we felt to frame today from a perspective of the questions of both rhetoric and dissent. The reason why I chose to look at these issues was first of all because rhetoric of course speaks to the kind of language which gives rise to ideology and it's the language of political power and so too of law. But in opposition or in questioning the examination of key questions, one finds dissent. We may say that dissent is an act of speech, it is a kind of performance and it's in participation with one another. So as we listen and as we speak and engage, therefore we test our assumptions, we further our knowledge and we further consider what the future will bring. Thailand's Les Majesté law is an extraordinary law and given its use and its context. The number of charges of Les Majesté Sure, um, just an apology for those of you who are waiting for um, an interpreter to arrive. She's just on her way, so she's running a little bit late. Sure, so if anyone can help out, feel free to. Uh, so as I said, Tan Ansela's Majesty Law is extraordinary, and the number of such charges has grown exponentially in the period following the 2006 coup. And this has had serious ramifications for both citizens and media alike. We come together this evening at an especially critical point in contemporary Thai politics. Several damaging Les Majesté cases have recently come about that involve the Les Majesté law. The death in custody of political prisoner Akong or Uncle SMS. A Les Majesté charge has been filed against the gentleman sitting beside me here. Charges brought about against the National Human Rights Commission, and of course, last week's criminal sentence against Chirinuj Premchaiporn, who would be held responsible for not deleting Les Majesté comments quickly enough. These are serious questions in an increasingly unsure period of time. And so, with each of these developments in mind, and no less the questions of rhetoric and dissent, do allow me to begin today by warmly welcoming each of our panelists. So the first, uh, the first among us to speak today will be the gentleman here, Prawit. He is, of course, one of Thailand's most esteemed journalists. And as a member of the media myself, it is a particular honor to welcome him here today. Prawit has proved over the course of his long-standing career both meticulous and prolific in his coverage of political affairs. He has withstood great political pressure in order to document human rights across the countries, no less political prisoners and prisoners of conscience. His work continues to new set new standards in ethical and independent Thai media. Please join me today in welcoming Prawit Rajana Brook. I thought you were going to introduce other speakers first, or? Okay. <laughs> uh, um, um, good evening to everyone. And uh, first, my apology that I think we'll be speaking in English. But Ajahn Ben Anderson might uh, be speaking in Thai. <laughs> but um, nevertheless, uh, I have been given the honor to uh, start speaking and first let me thank Lisa for making this uh, event um, possible um, especially taken into the considerations that the venue had to be changed um, um, I think at least t twice or three times due to um, the I think all too apparent um, um, culture of fear um, that uh, exists and, and persist in Thai society today with regard to the last majest law. I will uh, touch on a, a few um, 
topics uh, for about 10 to 15 minutes, and I hope um, it would address the title of the symposium t today. Let me start with. Uh, 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 let me start by saying that um, I think the debate uh, on less majest law today in Thailand is has been ra rather narrowly defined. Uh, to that of uh, a legalistic um, um, matter. Uh, by no means, and I'm not a trained lawyer, Ajahn Sulak, I think is a barrister of law, uh, went to Middle Temple. Uh, I mean, maybe he could dwell more on that, but we all know that the Nitirat group, or the Enlightened Jurist group, has been uh, instrumental in um, driving a campaign for the amendment of the law on top of the campaign committee to amend uh, Article 112 of the Penal Code, which is the less majestic law. But besides that, um, from my point of view, I think uh, the cultural side of the law and the belief in the institution as an institution which should be beyond criticism hasn't really been explored. And so I might like to start by uh, touching on the, the dimension, the religious dimension of the, ro the perceived role of the monarchy institution, which I think uh, uh, is important in putting the whole debate very passionate debates on both sides um, into a, a wider context that's not limited to the law. I'd like to propose that perhaps, well, before I start, you know, I was at a coffee shop this afternoon and one lady walked in whom I don't know and she was wearing a t-shirt which stated, love is my religion. And with that, uh, it coincided with what I would try to suggest, uh, which is, the psychological need for having the monarchy institution as a surrogate monotheistic religion for Thai royalists and ultra royalists. Let me start by saying that uh, many ultra royalists and royalists would uh, wish and want to maintain the perception uh, towards the monarchy institution as something uh, sacred as opposed to something profane. And when we talk about something profane, I think uh, uh, we, or most Thais, I think are well aware about the profanity or the evilness of politicians, of uh, virtually all political parties. And so with this sense of revulsion, which is widespread among Thais uh, toward the uh, what they call the elected politicians, that, that, that perhaps I would suggest that these people feel a need that perhaps in Thai society there's a need to have something sacred and profane uh, beyond uh, criticism as opposed to the dirty, evil, corrupt politicians. Um, and of course, in order to maintain the sacredness an idealized um, um, perception or notion of the monarchy institution, uh, one must also place the institutions above criticism or scrutiny. And this is where the less majestic law as well as the Computer Crimes Act come into place. So it's not just a matter of human rights, you know, freedom of expression, but there is this dimension. And as a surrogate religion, uh, there are several rituals um, related to the monarchy institution. Of course, you have the royalist songs, you have his majesty's composed uh, jazz music, events, extravaganzas in honor or in reverence of the monarchy institution, the king and the queen. You could wear yellow and pink every day if you like, as, and 
identification of your relevance and, and love for the monarchy institution. And uh, you can also keep your bumper sticker, Lao Rak Paw, or We Love Father, uh, at the back of your car. That is also a religious text if you are a subscriber of the monarchy institution as this sort of surrogate religion. And of course, the texts are bountiful. Anyone who has been to Chulalongkorn University's bookshop at Siam Square or the main one at the university would notice that, especially the one at Siam Square, there's a whole book section on royally written texts and some contains compilations of um, what we call royal saying or parachadamri in Thai. And on top of that, of course, the famous uh, sufficiency economy or Siddhikit Pohpiang. So there you have the text and there are preachers who are not necessarily loyal, royalty themselves. Um, people like Khun uh, Sume Tanti. Tanti Vajakun. The uh, he often, who is the, I think, principal uh, secretary to His Majesty, is he? Or? I think he runs a foundation, what is it called? Uh, the, I said Chai Patana, I don't think so. Yeah. Well, basically, he served the king for uh, his loyal aid, and he would often speak about the various uh, royal philosophies, including um, um, sufficiency economy. Once, several years ago, he spoke at Chula and happened to be there. And uh, after he talked about sufficiency economy, he would leave on his chauffeured Mercedes. So, very sufficient. Um, and Monk, recently, uh, Venerable War Wachira Meiti, I think, has been playing a very uh, important role in um, spreading uh, the king's um, saying as a supplement, perhaps, to the Buddhist teaching, and he's very active um, on the mainstream mass media. So, you have that. And of course, all this would be incomplete without Satan or evil. Back in the 70s, it was communism. Today, it's Thaksin Chinawan. And Red Shirts are just supporters of Satan in, in this regard. And last week, uh, we saw the Yellow Shirts uh, who surrounded the parliament. and and again recite this call for battle in defense of the monarchy institution by defeating Thaksin. So you see that, and who are some of us here who are critical of the monarchy institution, if, or at least critical of the less majestic law, I would like to propose that we are merely infidels, non-believers, people who are either direct supporter of Satan or a tacit supporter of Satan. And that's why life as someone on the evil side, according to this religion, is not very uh, comfortable. Ajahn Sulak, uh, uh, who I think he will speak, and I wouldn't like to speak for him, but as a, a critical royalist, had himself been tried under the less majestic law twice, right? Three times? Yeah, that's right. Yes. I recall several years back during the last trial, and I hope that's going to be the last, his personal secretary cried in the courtroom. That was Pilata, by the way, that's her name, while the judges was were reading the verdict. Well, it wasn't clear to her at that time whether he would receive a guilty or not guilty verdict, but then she began crying in the courtroom. So there was something I, I uh, still remember. But ironically, this sh 
shortcomings or the evilness of politicians that ties most educated ties love to bash on it's only made possible due to the scrutiny and legal criticism of politicians while on the other hand the same um, cannot be said about uh, the monarchy institution due to the constraints imposed by the less majestic law and the Computer Crimes Act. Now, my second point, now moving on from religion, is that there is, been, you know, I'm rather active on Twitter for the past six months and got into trouble with. Um, discussing uh, you know the controversy of the less majestic law and the computer crimes act but what I observe is the persistent denial amongst a good number of ultra royalists that they exist no censorship or self censorship in Thailand with regards to anything critical of the monarchy institution um, let me give a Example, but well, he's not really a royalist. But even the media, I think, I think a large swath of the Thai mainstream mass media is still in the um, state of denial. Um, one of my favorite fellow senior journalists, Khun uh, Prasong, uh, in the picture here, he gave an interview. Uh, to this glossy magazine called Image magazine in January this year. And this is taken from the magazine, page 45. And let me read the question. There were a few questions you know, on this one page sort of interview of Kun Prasong. And Kun Prasong was asked in Thai, Mong Hen Sang Khom Thai, Nai Mek Gern Sipi Kang Na Pen Yang Rai. How do you see Thai society in no more than 10 years from now? Most interesting. Now he answered. Let me first read it in Thai. อาจต้องเผชิญการเปลี่ยนแปลงครั้งใหญ่ในเร็วๆนี้ส่วนจะเป็นไปทางด้านบวกหรือลบขึ้นอยู่กับว่าขึ้นอยู่กับสังคมไ
about basic rights for freedom of expression for Thai people. It's also about equality, and it's about the whether Thai society will be able to become mature. And without Ajahn Sulak or without myself, or under the future reign and without us, I can't see a scenario why or how someone else wouldn't just step in and question the law and do something in trying to change it. And that's perhaps enough of a measure of hope for me. And uh, I believe what had transpired in Thailand over the past six or seven years have reached a point of no return. Thank you. Okay, so please allow me a moment to introduce um, Professor Benedict Anderson. In describing the nature and the position of the intellectual in social and political life, the historian Edward Said would prescribe the following, and he asked this of critics everywhere. He said, a critic is someone whose whole being is staked on a critical sense, a sense that they are unwilling to accept an easy formula or a ready-made cliché or the smooth and ever so accommodating com confirmations of what the powerful and the conventional have to say. And in saying this, it is a particular privilege for me to welcome this evening Professor Benedict. As one of the most acclaimed scholars of this century, best known for his book Imagined Communities, and no less scholarship that has been translated into over 20 different languages in some 400 publications across the globe, Professor Anderson is recognized as a senior authority on questions of nationalism, authority, and society. He serves most recently as Emeritus Professor of International Studies, Government, and Asian Studies at Cornell University. Please join me in the particular honor of welcoming Professor Benedict Anderson. I'm just worried about um, uh, whether we're speaking too much English or we have to speak English or mix it up in some way. Uh, so if you don't mind, probably what I will do is to speak some bad Thai and maybe a little bit better English. I think that um, if you look outside Thailand, uh, I'm actually writing a long article on uh, the 27 surviving monarchies in the world. Uh, that is 13% of the countries in the United Nations, not very large. Um, that the uh, solid monarchies, the ones that one can see likely to be around uh, are striking by the fact that though they have a leg majesty laws, they all do, but these laws are more or less uh, not used at all. Um, you can find in British magazines and uh, newspapers, there are jokes about the royal family, some of them not very friendly, but the institution is strong enough that people who want to laugh, laugh, and that's it. It's striking that the uh, laws for Les Majesty increase in harshness as the monarchy is afraid. And it's striking that, for example, uh, in Europe, the country with the uh, harshest Les Majesty law is Spain. And there's a good reason for that, which is that um, there is a huge scandal going on now uh, in Spain 
um, which has now reached the point that many journalists and uh, commentators and politicians and so forth have actually said that it is time that the king abdicates. And you want to think about abdication because that is the best way for a monarchy to stay if it has undesirable members. Abdication is not something traditional, but it is a solution to problems where the ruler or the successor is really un unacceptable. The interesting thing about the Spanish uh, Legimas State Laws is that they uh, have been harshly uh, used, but in the present crisis, the royal family doesn't dare do anything, doesn't dare to uh, try to put people in jail for um, Les Majeste, because the scandals that have opened are out of the control even of Spain. Uh, this, I just wanted to describe this to you because you may not know it. The uh, king was notorious for a long time for going on long vacations, very expensive at the taxpayer's uh, expense, and with no information about where these uh, vacations were and who went with him and so forth and so forth. It wasn't a good idea, especially as Spain has a 50% unemployment rate of young people and a 23% uh, unemployment of adult people. This last time it turned out that he had gone to shoot elephants in uh, southern Africa. And there are two striking things about this. The monarch had made his uh, mark internationally by becoming the honorary president of the World Wildlife Protection Fund. So here is this man who is the protector of wild animals everywhere, is discovered shooting elephants. Uh, not good, uh, not, not a good sign. Then it turned out that this vacation was not paid by himself, it wasn't paid by the taxpayer, but was paid by a Syrian billionaire, or, uh, who turns out to be a right-hand man for a high Saudi Arabian uh, minister. And this is completely secret. Here is the king getting a free, uh, long uh, elephant hunting uh, holiday. Uh, with money from murky Syrian businessmen and an even murkier Saudi Arabian one. And then it turned out that the reason for this is that the king had interfered to make sure that Spanish corporations uh, would be the ones who would build. And this is something you really need to uh, enjoy, which is there's going to be a uh, top speed like the Shinkansen, a top speed railway, especially for pilgrimages to the holy cities of Mecca and Medina. So you can fly in first class in an airplane, uh, you can then take a high speed uh, air conditioned uh, trip to with the holy cities and so forth. And this is all being arranged by a Catholic country and so forth. So it looks very much like as if basically he'd done what politicians do, which is uh, you get a kickback from uh, making sure that certain companies get certain jobs. So this is a question of being telling lies, it's a question of uh, doing shady business dealings uh, uh, and making money out of them. And, of course, for a long time now, there's been plenty of gossip about his uh, sexual behavior, uh, which has alienated him completely from his wife. Now, this is a monarch who has a lot to hide, and has been hiding it quite successfully. 
for a long time, but it's now not possible to do this anymore because uh, there's too many uh, media sources uh, all around the world and they will want to know about this. And so I just give it as an example that when uh, mass majesty laws are built, typically it is because the person who is behind them has things of which they or he or she grew up. Uh, and the defense for that is increasing the uh, less majesty laws. And, and this is not just the case of Spain, you can find it in other places as well. Um, and so you can take this as a sign, not so much that Satan is doing better, uh, but the opposite, that God is not doing so well. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, I think, one way one has to think about this. And the other thing is to note is that monarchies these days, uh, in every country, are the last. That is to say that if the, the dynasty, the family dies out, uh, then there will be no new dynasty to take its place. All monarchies are aware of this. And in most cases, that actually encourages them to behave better than they used to, because after this, it's going to be a republic of some form or another. That's the second point. And, uh, even though the, the uh, system of abdication is going to be a help, um, um, the second thing I think when I want to emphasize, and I'll stop here, uh, one of the reasons that um, the source for a kind of worry or is something quite simple, there's nothing directly to do with monarchy here, but you can see it elsewhere, and that is the, uh, the put non by trauma. If you look at the Bangkok Post statistics on the number of uh, Putai Thai who were wearing yellow robes or orange robes for being Prat or Nen 10 years ago, the number of people in these robes was still 6 million Thais. But last year, they said that the number had dropped to 1,500,000. That is a colossal change. In 10 years, um, the, uh, the active uh, Buddhist monks lost about 70% of what they had before. And this isn't because of a plot. It's because of a very rapidly changing uh, urbanization, uh, media, and, uh, new forms of consumerism, and so forth and so forth. And uh, this means that the space for uh, holiness, as it were, is really quite seriously damaged. And insofar as monarchies traditionally have had some kind of a religious aura around them. This is something that one needs to uh, to keep an eye out on. And those are the two things that uh, I think uh, I should say. There's a sort of the, no, there's one thing I want to add, and that is I remember very vividly, um, maybe about six years ago, I was coming back from the south. Uh, into Bangkok on the eve of an election. And this territory which we were driving through, yeah, it's uh, Chumpon, uh, Petburi, etc., uh, etc. Et um, I was looking for all the uh, billboards for Prachatipat from the Democratic Party. To my absolute astonishment, I couldn't find almost any driving for about two to three hours. 
this is supposed to be the place where um, Prachatipat is at most stronger. No, the uh, roadside is divided something like 70% to 30%. 30% is Kosana for Pra by various monasteries. And this adds for uh, charms and amulets, which is a big business. And the other 70% were, in a way, I mean, you can't say this, it's not polite, but uh, it's as if one was looking at a election campaign. That is, somebody is running for election or re-election or more re-election. And this is a big contrast to what the situation was like, say, 40 years ago. That is, the more that anxiety exists, uh, it's not merely that less majesty is more tough, it's also that the reverse side of this, that is an enormous campaign uh, to, I mean, I think it's bureaucrats mainly, and maybe police, to uh, drown the uh, visible uh, roads, shops, uh, etc., etc., with endlessly repeated uh, pictures of members of the royal family. I mean, it's understandable, uh, but you will find it hard to find anywhere else in the world where so much energy is put into this kind of message. And again, I think one has to understand that, uh, I mean, sometimes I even, I won't say that it's too nasty, but anyway, uh, I had Kim Il-sung in my mind, um, that the signs of uh, this kind of uh, massive saturation of public space is also comes from the same expression. We don't need to have this kind of thing in England or in Sweden or in Monaco because uh, it's too much. Uh, you know, and you have to know in these situations, you know, how to react sensibly. And I'll give you one final short anecdote uh, that will give you an idea. When I was a student at Cambridge, after every showing in the Irong Nam, in the uh, cinema, we just seen, for example, a fantastic movie by some great Japanese or a great Russian or something. And as soon as the movie ended, there was a short on the screen of Queen Elizabeth on horseback. And it's always the same. And uh, if you were very, you were crying or you were inspired, uh, you couldn't bear it. So you would, uh, I was young and reasonably athletic then, all my friends we would rush out of the cinema as soon as uh, Kurosawa had ended. And, and even though elderly people were furious and yelled at us, and sometimes even tried to hit us, uh, we weren't hurt. The next step came about 10 years later, in the 60s, when I think they had a better idea, which was to move the short picture of, uh, film of Elizabeth to the beginning of the movie. So that's next to the advertisements for chocolates and um, what do you call that, uh, popcorn and soap and so forth. And, and that's very easy, then you just waited in the lobby until the advertisements were over, and then you went in to see Kurosawa. It was a more tactful way to... Pro and then, ten years after that, the palace gave up. And now you can see any movie you like in England without having to see a short. And actually, it's in the benefit of uh, because people really were irritated by this. Why do we have to have this every time do we go to the movie? And now people are quite content. I mean, we get some good stuff about the royal family, but not all the time, and not everywhere. So again, I think you know, one has to sort of uh, hope that um, there be more flexibility here and more understanding of what Thai society today is like and aspires to. <laughs>